everyone. So um, I'm talking to Juliet Goodwin today, and she's a nutritional therapist. And just before we start, um, just a little disclaimer here. We just wanted to make it very, very clear that everything that we're discussing is, is obviously general advice um, and that it's recommended that you get checked out by your doctor. Um, they check your levels of um, nutrients in the body. And then if you have any concerns, they will be able to help you further or um, maybe seek some help from a qualified nutritionist as well. Good, so welcome, Juliet. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Hello, well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> and just uh, kind of to, to get started with, I was really interested to know how did you get um, into becoming a nutritionist? Was this something you always wanted to do? No, not at all. So my background is that um, I have been a nurse for a long, long time. And that's what I trained to do when I when I kind of left school um, and uh, went to university and did that. And so I was always interested in helping people. I was sort of interested in the caring professions, um, but also quite interested in science as well. And um, so I've been doing that a long time. And I think I became aware of its limitations and just started becoming more and more interested in holistic health. Um, natural ways of healing and just about kind of other approaches outside of the kind of quite prescriptive Western medicine um, approach although it definitely has its place and, um, and I, I, I've seen people get better um, but I also was seeing um, sort of uh, lots of it was almost Groundhog Day lots of people coming back with the same problems or lots of people not healing and then it always I felt come down, came very much down to lifestyle and a, the biggest part of that would be nutrition. So then I started doing my own research. I had fam, uh, family with health issues and I wanted to support them. And the more I started researching, um, all roads seemed to lead to nutrition and um, what we're eating. So then I um, did my training and um, yeah, it's kind of taken off from there. And um, I'm always learning and I'm always finding it fascinating. Mm, yeah, so I, I mean, it's such yeah. a big subject, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think what's difficult is even for myself, there's so much research coming out and sometimes it contradicts something else. And, you know, we're told so much stuff in the media and so many people who are kind of um, taking an interest in food and, and whether they've done training or not, I don't know. But obviously there's lots of people telling us different things. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's just the, uh, always there's so much to learn. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's why I really, I was really keen to talk to you because I think there is such, so much information out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult to kind of, um, you know, obviously everyone has to kind of decide for themselves, isn't it? What, what works and what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and, and nutrition is, I think that's a really important thing to say. It is an incredibly individual thing because we all have. Um, unique requirements whether that's what our nutrient requirements are you know what our genetics are there's just so many different factors and that's why um, um, that there is very um, good general advice about nutrition and it doesn't have to be complicated mm. uh, but there's also always will be an individual aspect that, that some things work for some people and other things don't yeah I mean I, I will cover quite a lot of what I think are the general principles um, that that are, do help with good health, promoting good health. Mm. Good. So, I mean, in, in terms of um, scoliosis, obviously all of our community, um, everyone has scoliosis or they have someone close, um, maybe a family member that have a scoliosis. So what would you say, how can nutrition kind of affect um, bones and, and muscles? Mm -hmm. So it's it's vital as as you know nutrition is for all parts of the body, but um, in terms of bone health, um, if we have poor diet, then then um, that will cause inflammation. It puts our body into an acidic state, and if you're not getting um, a variety in your diet, not getting the nutrients from a high sort of fruit and vegetable and fiber and the balance, you're not getting your nutrients, then that will affect how the bones are being, um, how they develop in childhood, if you're not getting enough certain nutrients. And it's not just about calcium, but I think you're gonna ask me that later. So, so if you, I mean, there's lots of research to show that 
if you are getting a high amount of fruit, vegetables, um, and um, a good amount of healthy protein, then you are going to have um, strong bones and reduce the risk of fractures and, and uh, the loss of bone density, the, bo the bone mineral density, which is really important. Mm. So, um, yeah, so th there's lots of things to add in and then I can talk about that later, lots of things to kind of, to reduce. Yeah, so do you have any kind of practical examples or what are kind of the foods that we should be maybe eating more of and what, uh, what should yeah. we consider leaving? So, um, in terms of, I know that lots of people get told this, eat your five a day. I mean, I would say that's probably for an adult a bit, not quite enough, but if you're starting, if your starting point is you don't have any fruit, then, you know, you have to be realistic. You, you start with maybe a couple of, the, sorry, fruit and vegetables, you start with a few bits, but ideally I would say for an adult, um, seven to 10. Now for a lot of people that seems a huge amount, but you can get that in so many different ways and it doesn't have to be an, an enormous amount. You can get it through smoothies, but that, and when I say seven to 10, that's fruit and vegetables, but you should be aiming for more vegetables than fruit because obviously fruit is great. You get lots of vitamins, um, but obviously it's high in fructose, which is a sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's more beneficial to have high level of vegetables, which um, are very alkalizing, both are alkalizing, but, but um, they're less sugary. Right. Um, so if I'd be aiming for at least seven, if possible, fruit and veg a day, predominantly vegetables, um, good quality protein. So, um, Protein makes up 20 to 30 percent of our bone, and so that's important to get good um, sources of protein. So it, it doesn't have to just be meat; it can be vegetarian protein through beans, pulses, um, lentils, nuts, and seeds are fantastic source of not only um, protein but omega three. And omega three is an anti it's, it's anti inflammatory. It's found in fish oils um, as well. Um, but that's really important for reducing inflammation in the body. Um, and what else? So what have I talked about? Um, and adding in, um, um, and it's, and also thinking about what you shouldn't have. So, um, nowadays the Western diet is, a uh, is quite heavily refined carbohydrates, a very beige diet. Um, and the problem with that, it makes it, it that's a very, very inflammatory um, diet and it puts our body into a more acidic state. Mm -hmm. And um, when your body's in a more acidic state, it's drawing calcium from the bones. Um, and also it's strongly linked with disease, causing disease and worsening pre-existing disease. So reducing, definitely reducing things like carbonated drinks, um, coffee, um, because that will help that cause it that's well particularly carbonated drinks have phosphoric acid in and that can um that can reduce calcium absorption and increases the loss of it um so um i can talk about it now or later i know we're going to talk about um, whether we need calcium yeah let's talk about calcium. it now yeah so um Calcium is definitely important for bone health, for the for the um, for remodeling, for um, for the growth of bone, and particularly and, and we need differing amounts through different life stages. Um, so for children, they need a very very high amount, um, but we need less after the age of thirty. We do need less because we're doing sort of less of the remodeling and the the laying down of new bone. That's not to say it's not happening, but there's a lot less. So, um, so it is essential, but it's it only plays one part of the whole um, picture. So, um, yes, it is important, but you need vitamin D to help absorb the calcium. So they really work synergistically, and um, and you can't um, understate the importance of vitamin D. Um, that's really um, an important issue because in Western, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, we have uh, low levels because obviously we don't have enough sunlight, especially through winter. So there's quite a high amount of people who have deficiency in vitamin D. And so it's particularly important if you have any bone condition that you get your vitamin D levels checked and make sure you have, um, and if you don't have enough, then it can be hard to get it through food. It is possible, right. but mostly we, the, the greatest absorption is through the sun, is from the sun. Um, and so then you might want to think about supplementing. 
mm. with it. But vitamin D, also vitamin K2, is really important in terms of locking in that calcium. So um, quite often you might see in shops there's vitamin D um, uh, supplements that also have K2 in because it helps um, drive the, the, the calcium from the blood into the bone. Mm. So, so um, vitamin D, uh, you say, is, is more almost, is it more important to supplement because we don't get it naturally as easily as calcium? Is that I right? think quite often there's, um, I think you can get a good amount of calcium from your diet. Mm -hmm. And I think with calcium supplementation, you need to be really careful because it's easy to, to kind of have too much. And then obviously you can cause problems like kidney stones. So right. again, you need your calcium levels checking, but, um, but um, you won't be absorbing that calcium either if you don't have enough vitamin D and the K2 as well. So it could be circulating in your bloodstream, but just not getting through to the, to the bones as efficiently as it could. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I think vitamin D, that there often is an indication for supplementation. But nowadays you can get your vitamin D checked really easily. So through your GP or there's private testing, you can order a kit online. So, so but I would say, yes, especially as we're now kind of well into winter, that there, there would be quite yeah. a lot of lower D, vitamin D levels. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. How does that actually work? Can you say, can you go to your GP here in the UK and say... Uh, I'm concerned about my um, vitamin D and and calcium levels. Can you can you check them? Do do you have to be very specific, or or do they check all the levels of? So they they wouldn't automatically check something like that. Um, so I think especially if you have scoliosis, you have a bone condition. I think you've got a very um, uh, genuine need for checking the the vitamin D rather than it just being out of interest or. Um, you know, I think, I think it is really important for that, for that bone um, health. So you would need to ask, I don't think they would um, automatically do it because you're on their, on, you know, on their computer system and have a condition that might sort of require that testing. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Would they feel that, um, do they easily kind of go down that route or do they say, oh, uh, you know. I think it's very individual. I think, I think, I think it just depends on your GP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if you're having problems, there's definitely um, other ways of getting it tested. Um, and there's even nowadays, you can do finger prick tests at home and send off to companies. So you don't right. have to find a phlebotomist or find a clinic to take your blood from um, the you know, venous sample. Yeah, good. Um, what did I, I wanted to ask about the, uh, the, the whole, the milk uh, question as well, because there's it's very conflicting information nowadays about milk. So I'm a, a mum of two, yeah. two little kids. Obviously, we get told pretty much every day and when they were babies even more, they need milk, they need cow's milk. Um, my son has got eczema. Mm -hmm. so I made, we made the decision to cut out cow's milk. Mm -hmm. and now my husband is also off it and I also stopped um, having yeah cow's milk mm -hmm. um how important like just i'm um, not so much for bones maybe but for muscles i also had conflicting information about that do we uh, do we need it or is it well i mean calcium isn't just for bones there's other functions so it's involved in any action um so contraction where you need sort of contraction activity in the body so that would include the heart um mm -hmm. and muscles um, but there's so many non-dairy sources of calcium, but it's interesting what you sort of raised earlier about having children. So I would always be very reluctant to um, say to, to parents or to anybody regarding children to cut out their sort of um, dairy, only because children can be very fussy eaters mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, dairy does produce, it uh, does provide calcium, magnesium, and potassium, and it's a very bioavailable form. So compared to maybe some other food sources, you get the calcium a lot. Um, it's just a lot more available. But and, and and I think the thing, if children are very reluctant to eat other foods, sort of uh, uh, lots of vegetables, nuts, seeds, then 
I would be reluctant to um, advise removing the dairy, but the idea is you want to try and kind of have variety. Um, so certainly I don't believe that dairy needs to be your primary source of calcium. There are other, other foods and I can list them, but um, I think I'd always be careful with children because they are laying down bone. They, they have such a high requirement for calcium that if they are not really eating a very, very mixed and varied diet, um, uh, the priority is that they get the calcium really. Yeah. So, but but um, it, you just have to kind of assess, look at that child's diet. Are they getting enough sources of calcium from other foods? But it, but certainly, I don't believe the calcium only comes from dairy. That that's our. However, it is bio, more bioavailable. But there's lots and lots of other foods. So sardines, um, uh, tin sardines with the bones still in them, are really really high in calcium. And um, what's great is you're getting it's a it's an oily fish. You're getting your omega threes. So that's anti-inflammatory. Um, so salmon and apparently tin salmon could be because it might still have the bones in tofu um sesame seeds so quite a few seeds have calcium in um and then things like bok choy your collard greens um uh, quite a few dark um green leafy vegetables uh broccoli is a very good one yeah, yeah some in beans and lentils so um there's definitely lots of other very healthy foods mm. and the thing about having lots of dairy i mean that will put your body into a slightly more acidic state and it is a more inflammatory food right so i think everything in moderation mm. and the, the key to whatever your medical condition or whatever is going on in your body is is with food is variety because a lot all the evidence shows that in, in order to support our gut health um, we need to have as many different um, foods as possible to feed all the good bacteria, to have that good balance. And then a lot of other um, of our systems will be in better health if our gut is in good health as well. Mm. So I don't know if I went off track there. A bit. No, no, it's good. It's great. Excellent. Uh, yeah. um, uh, we had quite a, so I, I did ask in the, in the Facebook group, I asked if anyone had any question as I'm talking to, to a mm. nutritionist. Mm. And you saw that there was a, a big amount of question. I mean, it's obviously a topic that everyone is really, really um, uh, interested in. And, yeah. and obviously it's something that, that we can implement relatively easy, easily, isn't it? So it's, it's not like... Yeah, I, I think that's a really great thing that you can empower yourself. You're not, you're not being looked after by someone else. You're not going to see someone else that will make decisions about your healthcare. Although that, you know, I'm not saying it will replace that, but it's something that you can be proactive. Uh, and, you know, and, and even just making small changes can make a huge difference, like cutting out the, the, the trying to cut out the sugar, the carbonated drinks, right. um, the alcohol, suddenly a lot of inflammation will be decreased. Mm. Um, then you are, your body goes into more healing mode. You know, you're alkalizing the body when you increase the vegetables and you decrease the refined carbohydrates. So these, and you don't have to do it all at once. So sometimes if you've got a very kind of Western diet, which is very beige, very kind of lots of bread, lots of white carbs, lots of refined carbohydrates and sugars, it's very hard to just suddenly switch to, right, I'm going to be kind of having seven fruit and veg a day and this protein. And then, so I think, you know, just do it gradually and, and even little small changes see a difference. And people, I think one of your questions was about fatigue and, and just sometimes just a few tweaks in the diet can help increase your energy levels because you're getting those B vitamins and they're crucial to energy. You're getting just lots of other, you know, the antioxidants and um, other, other minerals and vitamins. Yeah. Good. Shall we, shall we go through some of yeah. those questions then? So we have tried to kind of condense it a little bit because there was just too much and um, difficult to, to cover obviously everything. Um, but uh, Joe, for example, is, is asking, I'd be interested to know if any particular vitamins can help and are recommended, um, what foods to avoid, what foods may help. So we've, we've kind of um, covered that or you've covered it already. Is there anything you want to kind of add to that? To that? Well, I think another nutrient that I didn't mention, which is really, really important, is magnesium. Magnesium is amazing. It's needed for so many functions in our body. Um, and um, it's also very important for bone health. 
Um, and I think I was reading somewhere that um, there is a, there has been some research done about people with scoliosis and having low magnesium levels. Um, and also it's relevant to, I think one of the other questions from um, someone from your group was about the menopause. Um, so people, um, women in the menopause often have lower um, magnesium levels. So you can get that from your dark green leafy veg again wonderful they have so many different great things in um bananas have magnesium nuts so there's there's various um foods mm. but but yeah that that's quite an important nutrient um and um there was um basically yes there was a study that's something i was going to mention and done in 2012 called the combination of uh, what's it called micronutrient for bone health and it was a big research study um they showed that um it was a a, a variety of um nutrients that were required um to use synergistically so to for to them to be used together for bone health. And that was not only calcium, but as I said, the vitamin D, the K2, what else is it? It was um, um, also strontium and magnesium. So all of, the, yeah, yeah, and the fish oils, and the fish oils. So those were the main, the key ones that, that um, they were as effective, if not more effective, than some of the pharmaceutical medications that, that sort of, the, um, for helping with bone conditions that contain calcium and various other things. So there's a lot of prescription medicines which seem to work less well than if you had a very sort of good variety of those particular nutrients. Another thing that um, some a consultant has, has um, mentioned to me at the scoliosis clinic was vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 um, combined with bit, vitamin D. Is that um, is there something you can tell us about that? Um, yeah, so we've discussed vitamin D and the importance of how that helps the bones um, draw in the calcium. Um, and so that is that is a really important um, uh, vitamin in terms of bone health. Um, B12 also has an effect on bone building cells. Um, and um, there are other vitamins as well. So. Um, and as I said, B12, quite often you get from dairy products, eggs, um, animal proteins. So you have to just be really careful if you're following a vegan diet that um, you wouldn't get that naturally from the food you have on a vegan diet. So you'd need to supplement with B12. So um, I think it's always worth getting your levels checked because if you have quite a varied diet and you are getting the animal protein in, your B12 levels might be adequate. So it's always checking before supplementing. Um, but those are the foods that, um, and also vitamin A, um, sorry, it's not in that supplement, but that's another one um, which is involved in bone building. And vitamin A is often um, contained in orange foods. So things like squash, pumpkin, um, mangoes, carrots, cantaloupe. So always think orange and vitamin A. So that's another supplement. So I think it's, it's um yeah those those supplement those um, nutrients are all involved in bone building and the cells required for bone building but it's just kind of ideally you always want to get that from your diet first and that's how your body best absorbs the nutrients but for some people there is an, a deficiency whether that's because they're a vegan or because they have absorption issues and so that's why testing is, is can be helpful yeah, I think I think that's really important what what you're saying here. Rather than um, randomly getting supplements from from the supermarket, isn't it? It's and those tests. And you were mentioning um, a company be before we spoke to me, obviously before, and I have I have used them. Um, and so it's very accessible, isn't it? Those those tests where you can check your um, your levels of nutrients, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, because you need that starting point. You need to to know where where you're at, whether you're at a norm, within a normal range, deficient, or maybe excessive. Um, and then you look into why you are out of range if you are, because mm, it's yeah. a bit more complicated. Great. So, um, uh, so yeah, Shalina was asking about osteoporosis and menopause for over fifties with um, scoliosis. 
supplements how much i mean that's difficult to say mm -hmm. obviously um she would probably need to get um her levels checked mm -hmm. um and diet to help with with bone and muscle so again we've we've uh, covered that i think so um menopause you were saying calcs no what what did you say magnesium is important yeah well there's i mean there's always there's definitely an accelerated bone loss um in in menopause because there is this estrogen deficiency um unfortunately but there has been quite there was quite a big study to show that it was a diet high in vegetables fruit fish and whole grains um was associated with a less bone mineral density loss so um that was quite specific to women in their menopause. So right. following that diet of including those things will be very beneficial. And then there's also something called phytoestrogens. So that's dietary estrogens you can get from mainly plant foods. So that's beneficial when you're going through the menopause. So that would be things like it's contained in flax seeds, um, yeah. sesame seeds, oats, uh, tempeh, soy, soybeans. I'd always say, I mean, don't, um, just be careful you're not having genetically modified soy. I mean, you tend not to get that in the UK, but if there's anyone from abroad, just, just sort of make sure it's organic and non-GM. Um, the other thing with flax seeds, you, your body tends to absorb the nutrients better um, if you grind, grind them up. So that's something, to just a little tip. Um, yeah. But, um, and also I think there's more studies to show that, again, vitamin K2 um, can induce um, less bone, bone less loss in postmenopausal women. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's also, I don't know if um, if anyone's interested. Um, I think quite a good book out there for uh, women who are in the menopause and in terms of bone um, health is um, it's I've got it written down somewhere. It's uh, Marilyn Glenville. Mm -hmm. And she's um, written a book, I believe, about menopause and osteoporosis. So that may be of interest to people yeah, who are at that kind yeah. of stage. And, um, and I can link to that, um, obviously, in the description. Yeah, file. yeah. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, so Mary was asking about turmeric. I don't know if I've yeah. pronounced right turmeric. Turmeric. Yeah. <laughs> post-operation so she's obviously talking about um uh, spinal fusion operation i guess to to help um recover and help with mm -hmm. operation. So, yeah. yeah well turmeric is certainly having its moment um although it's not new it's obviously been around for yeah. hundreds of years um but um i think in the west we're now recognizing its incredible anti-inflammatory properties so in terms of post-surgery yes definitely and just generally it's a good thing to have because it's so anti-inflammatory again i believe there's studies that have been done that show that it has as much much of an anti-inflammatory effect if not more than your prescription anti-inflammatory medicines i'm not advising that someone do that instead of but i just think um it's worth noting that there is research that people might be interested in in um, accessing in terms of its anti-inflammatory effect and so i would highly recommend it um, but something people don't or they're not always aware of um, so the active component of turmeric is called curcumin and um and in order to um improve absorption of that it's it's worth um combining it with black pepper so something called um piperin in black pepper um boosts the absorption of curcumin which is the active ingredient of turmeric but um yeah but certainly there's there's lots of evidence to show that it's it's a great anti-inflammatory um any, and you any can have it on how to i mean if you don't like turmeric in your in your food i i i had a smoothie before i think with turmeric. yeah so i mean it, it definitely has a distinct taste so what's yeah. i think become quite popular lately um are what's called the golden milk so that's um a milky drink but that doesn't have to be a dairy that can be a plant-based milk um almond oat or coconut and then you put turmeric and then maybe a bit of black pepper and maybe a bit of honey um and uh, maybe a bit of coconut oil because that's a really another thing I haven't mentioned another good anti-inflammatory um, and antioxidant and um, that works quite well with the turmeric so you know there's some there's some recipes online but that yeah. a lot of people kind of quite like consuming it that way the turmeric lattes 
Mm, that sounds so, lovely, actually. Yeah, it's so, quite a warming, nice evening drink to have. So, um, yeah, if I can yeah. try it that way. I, I did have a chai latte um, with, with turmeric. So it's, it's similar, isn't it? That's kind of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just maybe kind of making sort of stews and adding it in. So you've got lots of different flavours going on. So it doesn't kind of necessarily mm. stick out too much. But yeah, yeah, definitely thumbs up in terms of anti-inflammatory. And there's a lot of research to go behind that. Yeah. Good. So um, B was asking about, uh, do people with scoliosis easy? No, what does she saying? Is scoliosis people easy to get tired? So I guess, yeah, do people get easily tired? I, I guess it's yeah. difficult to kind of generalize this. But she's saying personally, um, she, she feels like she's getting tired really easily. Any advice for this? I mean, well, we thought about vit vitamin B, I guess. Um, well, I think that's one that it's really difficult for me to answer because there could be an absolute myriad of reasons as to why this particular person is feeling tired. They might have some sort of nutrient deficiency. They might not be absorbing their nutrients properly. But there could be sort of just not the greatest um, gut health or kind of uh, the environment in the gut might not be uh, helping to absorb the nutrients. It could be that they're anemic. It could be that there's a thyroid issue. I mean, I'm aware with scoliosis that there can also be a mechanical and a physical um, reason in terms of the muscles are having to, my understanding is, I'm not an expert, is that my understanding is the muscles have to work harder in order to support um, the curvature of the spine. And, and, and so I think when they're working harder, sometimes um, I think there can be the pressing of, what was it I read? Um, um, uh, where was it? It was, I made a note of it somewhere here, if you just give me a second. But I mean, some of you probably already know. Yeah, so it was just um, scoliosis can put pressure on the chest cavity, which can affect the breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that can cause a bit of chronic fatigue. But in terms of this particular person, I think it's it, it's a very individual thing and I couldn't comment. But, but there can be, it, it could be scoliosis related and then it might not be. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and sometimes it can just be, you know, simple as dehydration um, or they're just not quite getting enough of the nutrients. So, yeah, that's a tricky one. But there's, there's a lot of reasons. I yeah. think um, I think dehydration, that's that's a good point, isn't it? I mean, I think uh, just drinking water solves so many problems. Yeah. And, it, and it's all part of flushing out our toxins and and. And that's why having um, a diet that's rich in, in vegetables and antioxidants, you get that from your blueberries and your vegetables and, and other fruit. But having a diet that's rich in that, you're, you're kind of reducing the, the toxic load. And the, having a high fiber diet is also very important because you're um, promoting that, um, that ridding of toxins, that detoxification, and also improving your gut health. So fiber is another one. Uh, but you will get that from your vegetables and your your whole foods, your whole grains. So try not to go for the white carbs, the refined um, and processed, because the processed foods is one of the biggest causes of inflammation in terms of our diet. What uh, about pasta then? <laughs> so there isn't a lot of nutrients from pasta. It depends <laughs> what it's made from. <laughs> so and you can get uh, brown rice pasta. There's uh, lots of different non-gluten forms and, and more from a whole food. But um, I would probably be encouraging people to just have more whole food rather than processed. And pasta is slightly processed. That's not to say it's an evil food. But, you know, if you were going to go for pasta, I would recommend the whole grain variety. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I would be promoting more the, the whole food, so the um, eating the potatoes, the, the grains, so whole grain rice, looking at quinoa, buckwheat, amaranth, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you kind of want to have um, yeah a whole grain. Uh, good. So um, let's see what <coughs> we've got left here. Um, so the calcium, we've we've talked. Um, enough about i think haven't we uh da, 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 da. bone density um felicia she was very active she had loads of questions okay. <laughs> so she <We> <laughs> okay. 
I would also like to know about salt's role in any um, inflammation for a person with regular to low end of normal blood pressure. Mm -hmm. I eat a lot of Himalayan salt, was told the salt is good for adrenals. Now I'm wondering if it's increasing sys systemic inflammation. I'm already gluten free and notice this makes a huge difference with decrease in inflammation. Yeah, so I mean, I'll touch on that. So for some people, going gluten-free can make a big difference because gluten can be an inflammatory food, but I'm not going to say that people need to cut out gluten. So that could certainly be why she was feeling better um, because it can be an inflammatory food, especially if there's gut dysbiosis, gut um, imbalance. In terms of the salt, um, you have to be quite careful with salt because it increases urinary um, loss of calcium. So I would have minimal amounts of salt. Um, I understand what she's saying about supporting your adrenals. I think it does have a place there, but there's lots of other ways of supporting your adrenals. So looking, you might want to look at your cortisol levels, um, look at your magnesium levels. Your adrenals need a lot of magnesium um, and look at lifestyle measures. What are your stress levels like? Can you address that? What's your sleep like? And just making sure you're getting all those nutrients through the fruit and vegetables, all the antioxidants. Um, vitamin C is also very important for the adrenals and vitamin C actually is also very important for collagen um, so that's that's important in terms of um, supporting the bones as well. So what's the link between salt and uh, blood pressure then? Um, well okay so um, the sodium increases blood pressure, the sodium in salt increases blood pressure so another thing that balances out the sodium is if you have more potassium containing foods so um that would be i'm just thinking so that so fruit and veg um, banana uh, that has potassium and magnesium in but so when you're thinking about your minerals you want to balance them so uh, so people who have higher levels of calcium that's balanced by with magnesium so there's lots of minerals that work in partnership and they're antagonistic so sodium raises the blood pressure um i don't think i can go into all of the the, the science behind that but essentially if you have too much sodium it raises the blood pressure right. and affects the kidneys um that's so it's through the through, through the um function of, of raising it in the kidneys um but potassium does help to lower sodium levels but i would just say don't have high salt levels because there are other ways of supporting your adrenals so okay. yeah okay. Because yeah, I, I, um, I think I've, I've got a friend, she must have low, low blood pressure, but she's feeling always, she's feeling cold. And um, she said it helped her to eat more salt. Um, yeah. But I guess, as you say, there's, there's different ways. Of oh, and I, I think everyone's um, sort of genetic and, and physiological uh, makeup of their body is so different. So it's difficult to know what, but certainly people do have more of a, a, a sort of salt requirement than others. Yeah. Um, Good. So then Felicia is also asking, I've been wanting to hear more information on bone health regarding paleo or vegan diet versus veg plant-based, provided body is maintained in an alkaline state for both eating plants. Um, any thoughts? <laughs> um, well, I would say with the paleo diet, quite often people who are following it are having quite high amounts of meat. Um, what, what is it? Sorry, just to, for so, anyone who might not. So, at paleo is the idea is it's going back to kind of um, a very long time ago where we had kind of it's the hunter gatherer time. So it was quite a meat based, and then you had your berries and maybe some sort of fruit vegetables. So we hadn't kind of had the the, the agricultural phase, and um, so there weren't really any grains. So with the paleo, it is um, meat, fish. Uh, berries, vegetables, but you're not really having um, grains and no sugar. Um, and so some people can interpret it by, and lots of people have their own versions, so they kind of do a bit of paleo, a bit of, but, and some people might be kind of doing more fish route. Um, but I think a lot of people having quite high meat um, paleo interpretation. Um, the only thing I would say to be careful of that, that um, meat has arachidonic acid in it and in high levels that will put the body into a more inflammatory state, it is an inflammatory um, uh, food. So uh, if you are going to go for the paleo, I would say don't have large amounts of meat and make sure that it's organic because if it's not, then you are going to have um, 
the um, you know, potentially it will have hormones, antibiotics, um, omega-6, and those are all things that, that are not good for the body. So it needs to be um, quality um, organic meat. Um, so if the, the on sort of the opposite side, uh, if it was a vegan diet, again, there are issues in terms of, uh, it's difficult to get some nutrients from a vegan diet. So B12, you won't get from a vegan diet. So you do have to supplement for that. Um, vitamin D, you'll have a lot less. Um, so it's balance really. I, I just, I just think, um, I'm not a big fan of one particular diet. I think everyone is so individual. Some people are more suited to low meat or vegetarian diets and some people, depending on so many things, your genetic, there's more and more research now to show it, they'll look at your gut bacteria, they'll look at your genes, even your blood type. And some people actually do seem to need meat and they're much more suited to it and then other people don't. So again, very individual thing. But, um, Go for quality organic meat and and remember it is an inflammatory food because of the arachidonic acid do you think um because it's interesting that you you're saying this uh obviously some people are suited to eating meat and some are some are not and obviously um there's also in, in ayurveda there's obviously the different types of, of what type of food people are suited to do you think that um our bodies know this very much and you're automatically drawn to those types of food. I'm saying this because like my children, for example, I've got my son who would eat meat all day and that's not because I don't even eat a lot of meat. Yeah. It's not because we have it, but he just, he just craves it and he doesn't like milk. Mm. Um, my daughter, she would eat cheese all day but mm. she would very easily um, not eat meat if she, if she didn't have to. She, mm. I think quite possibly, I think quite possibly our bodies know what they need, but that's not a very scientific. No, it's way. not. <laughs> <laughs> so don't hold me to that. Um, but, but yes, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't really eat meat and I, I think that's what suited me. Um, but I, you know, I can only speak for myself. I mean, mm. I, I do actually eat fish, but I think generally that was kind of better for me, but other people, they don't do so well with their health if they cut out meat. So it's, yeah. really, it's really interesting. Yeah, very interesting, mm -hmm. definitely. But yeah, you so want to be having a balance. You just want to be having sort of as much variety as possible. Yeah. Um, because that's the thing about taking vitamin, uh, sorry, or any supplement, is if it's um, a standalone vitamin or mineral, um, it's it's not an ideal way of um, consuming it because when you're eating foods and especially variety foods the vitamins and the minerals work synergistically and it's a bit like a football team on a pitch they kind of all need to work together to, to sort of you know make the game happen to win or and you think and that's really a good I think analogy for, for vitamins and minerals and so although um, it can be really helpful to supplement on when you've worked out there's a deficiency um, just getting them all in kind of, you know, through, through food um, and have that variety is the best way. Okay. Um, any, any other tips or resources that um, you might have that you could share with us? Um, well, two books that um, have come well recommended. There's uh, Marilyn Glenville, which I think I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the menopause and osteoporosis. So she's written a very good book about bone health and um, osteoporosis and also the menopause. So she's written a few books. Um, also, someone called Lara Pizzorno, say that right. Um, she's written a, a very good book about bone health. Um, but also I can give you links. Um, she has uh, a website which talks about her journey in terms of bone health. Um, uh, the British Nutrition Foundation has a website and also just going back to basics about what a healthy plate should look like, what your proportion of vegetable, protein, carbohydrates and giving you a bit of guidance. Um, so the British Association of Nutritional um, Therapy, BANT, they, um, I can also give you a link to that. They have a healthy eating plate, um, which can just be just, just to kind of get the basics right before you're kind of thinking over complicating things. Um, and also Dr. Mark Hyman is quite a good resource. He's, a, he's quite a knowledgeable um, functional medicine doctor. Um, 
And another website that I thought looked quite good um, was American Bone Health. Um, but in terms of other websites, it's sort of difficult to comment on their content and how well regulated it is. Mm. But that one looked quite informative. Um, yeah, so I, I can put those links, um, give them to you. Yeah, that would be great. I, I'm always looking for, I mean, first thing is obviously you're using Google when you're looking for for yeah. these things, but just like, um, you know, you've got the vitamin and then what sort of foods you can find it in. If you've got anything like that, that you can point us to, because again, the, the yeah. information out there obviously varies. Mm -hmm. And I can put something together that, that lists the, the nutrients I've discussed and then what foods um, contain those nutrients. And the good thing is, um, if you're eating a healthy diet, there's an overlap. Um, so a lot of the foods will contain more than one nutrient. They yeah. work in synergy. So, so if you're eating kind of a good amount of fruit, vegetables, um, healthy forms of protein, you're gonna get a lot of those nutrients combined. Mm. But I can put a list together if that's helpful for anyone. That would be brilliant, great. Thank you.